Well, good morning, church. Good on you for starting your week out right, giving it to the Lord the very first part of your week, and so uh, Lord's blessings on you, I'm sure. Have you ever heard of Edwin Thomas? Edwin Thomas. He was a master of the stage. It was during the latter half of the 1800s. The small man with the Uh, Just a huge voice, had few rivals. He debuted in Richard III uh, at the age of 15. He quickly then established himself as a premier Shakespearean actor. Uh, So most of you I know have heard of him. Uh, In New York, he performed Hamlet uh, for 100 consecutive nights. London, he won their approval too uh, over the tough British critics there. But when it came to tragedy on the stage, Edwin Thomas was a select, in a select group. But when it came to tragedy in life, the same could be said as well. Edwin had two brothers, John and Junius, J-U-N-I-U-S, Junius. John and Junius, both were actors. Neither one rose to his fame, though his stature. In 1863, the three siblings united their talents, though, and they performed Julius Caesar. Now, the fact that Edwin's brother John took the role of Brutus was an eerie harbinger of what awaited the brothers and our nation two years later. For this, John took the role of assassin in Ford's Theater. On a crisp April night in 1865, he uh, snuck into a box in the Washington Theater and he fired a shot at the head of Abraham Lincoln. Yes, the Last name of the brothers was Booth, Edwin Thomas Booth and John Wilkes Booth. Edwin was never the same after that night. Shame from his brother's crime just drove him into retirement. He would never have returned to the stage. We got a brand new mic here and it's, it's cutting out? Huh? I thought it was cutting out. Brand new, brand new, first time. I got to break it in. Uh, did I tell you Edwin was never the same? The shame of his brother's crime put him in retirement. He, he might never return to the stage uh, uh, had it not been for a twist of fate as he was at a New Jersey train station. Edwin was uh, waiting his coach to arrive when as well as he was, um, uh, as he was there, the crowd kind of pressed into him. He was pushed then uh, by that crowd between the platform and the, uh, the train, a, a moving train. Without any hesitation, Edwin wrapped his leg around a rail, and he reached down for him, pulled him up, and uh, pulled him to safety. Now, after the sighs of relief, the young man, he recognized the famous Edwin Booth had been his rescuer. Edwin, however, didn't recognize the young man that he rescued. That knowledge came weeks later in a letter, a letter that he carried in his pocket to his grave, a letter from an army general thanking Edwin Booth for saving the life of Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln. What an interesting twist of history that while one brother killed the president, the other brother saved the president's son. Edwin and John Booth, same father, same mother, same profession, Yet one chooses life, the other death. How could that happen? Though their story is dramatic, it's not unique. Cain and Abel, both sons of Adam. Adam chooses God, Cain chooses murder, and God lets him. Cain and Abel represent two kinds of givers in this life. You and I were either uh, like Cain or were like Abel. We're either like Cain or we're like Abel. Welcome to our new series, Let's Give Up. Let's Give Up. That's our new series. Let's say it together. Let's Give Up. If you don't give up the way that you think about giving, then you're never going to give up to the one that gave and gives us everything. Now, people, uh, some of you may be getting nervous. I, I, I can't see if we have any visitors out there today, uh, but if you're thinking maybe of inviting someone, you might be going, Shoo. Uh, maybe they'll come next week, maybe preach or talk about Jesus or something, you know. But uh, Jesus doesn't get nervous uh, when he talks about money because he's talking about your heart. And that's what he wants. He wants your heart. It's all about the heart. So for the next four weeks or so, in case you not keep you at which service should I invite my friend to, we're going to be focusing on let's give up. Okay, let's give up. Let's go back today almost to the beginning, and I'm serious about that. 
Let's go to Genesis chapter 4, okay, the fourth chapter of the whole Bible, uh, almost to the beginning. Genesis chapter 1 through 11, there's the, it sets the stage, those 11 chapters for uh, the, the whole Bible. There's so many firsts there, and they're all so very important to God, and they should be important to us, to his people. In Genesis chapter 1, we're told it's all about God, his sovereignty and creation. And in Genesis 1, 1, we're told in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what we too often will run to is, well, how did he do it? Uh, when did he, how long did it take him to do it? When the whole point is God, God, his sovereignty, he's the creator. He is who this book and all of life is about. Having made preparations in six days, he then, verse 27 tells us, God created mankind in his own image. I mean, wow. I mean, you and I created in the very image of God. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Wow, what a God. Genesis chapter 2 is all about marriage. If you remember that God took uh, out of a woman, he fashioned, out of the man, excuse me, he fashioned the woman, and then he brought them back together. So we have the man out of the man, he fashions a woman, brings them back together, that's called marriage. Bedrock uh, foundation institution of human civilization, the institution of marriage. Genesis 2 and verse 24, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united with his wife. They will become one flesh again. Genesis chapter 3, then, how things were told from paradise with God to, well, what we see around us today. God gives man uh, free will, gives us the ability to choose, to freely make choices of our own. Man chose to rebel against God. Sin entered into all of creation. And so God then put into motion a plan to bring man back into a right relationship with him. Genesis 3 and verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, referring to Jesus, the one that is to come, the seed of the woman, and you will strike his heel, referring to Satan, with just a strike of the heel, a near-death blow, uh, killing Jesus, though, but then Jesus, of course, having the last word and rising from the dead. Jesus fulfills that verse on the cross in the empty tomb. Genesis chapter 4, then, all about giving. All about giving. Before I move on, it's just as if God is saying this, I've got so much to teach you about. But before I move on, this is all that we know to this point now. He says, I'm going to pause now. I'm going to rightly re uh, show you how to relate to me and my blessings that I give you. How to rightly relate to me and my blessings that I give to you. Look at Genesis 4 and verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. This is the, the very first baby. Verse 2, then later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Cain follows in the footsteps of his father, Adam, as he works the soil. And Abel because, becomes the first shepherd uh, ever. And so we come to our first uh, thing I'd like you to see this morning. It's this, give God what is right, not what is left. Give God what is right, not what is left. Look at verse 3 now. In the course of time... Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Abel brings the, a, a first offering. It's a first of fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Cain brings some of the fruits of the soil. Now, we got to kind of, in our mind, push aside all that we've learned about giving from later on in, in scriptures and in, in God's instructions to his people. And remember, I deliberately went through all that because this is all we know. There's no command here for any worship at all of God. There's, you know, later on, it doesn't take much in, in uh, actually, we get to the end of this chapter, and it says, and man began to, to, to look to God, to, to, to search for God, that kind of thing. So it's before all of that. 
So nothing is said concerning that uh, a flock offering is superior to a soil offering or that one occupation is superior to the other. Nothing's being said that the keeper of the flocks couldn't get some of the fruits of the soil to use as his offering or that the worker of the soil, he couldn't go get a hold of something from the flock. Nothing is being said about one offering costing a life or that blood was shed and the other not. And it's as if God's up there looking on and he's like, this is interesting. This is going to be a very teachable moment here because without there being any law from from me or from Moses that I will eventually give to Moses, without there being any commandment to return my tithe to me, without there being uh, any passage of scripture at all, without uh, there being God's chosen people, uh, God wants us to know that giving has nothing to do with law or anything else like that, but everything to do with our heart. Everything to do with our heart. Abel brings of the firsts as his offering. Fat portions. Now, we've learned in the past few years that they're telling us to shy away from fat. Well, in their culture, they don't have all the other kinds of fat that we have in our diet that's injected in all these different things, you know, from a cookie to cracker and just on and on with all these other kinds of fat. So we need to limit our fats. Then the fat portions were showing that this, this animal was, was getting to, this was a good one. It was beefing up, you know, it was going to give us some more, and it was very much needed. It's a better part. And so uh, this better part, this fat portion from some of the firstborn of the flock, the very first of what Abel has, he's bringing to God the very best in the fat portions. Verse 4 says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Now notice now, earlier it said, Abel also brought an offering. Here, God flips it. uh, And and Abel's the one, the worshiper now is the focus. Not the offering anymore. And so it's kind of flipped there. It moved, the focus moves to the worshiper. Genesis 4 and verse 3. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Now notice how casual Cain's attitude is, revealing a lack of faith, a lack of of love or worship, in a sense, from his heart. So how does God respond? Verse 5 tells us, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, Cain gave an offering to the Lord. We've got to give him, give him that, right? Cain, he gave to the Lord. It's not about what Cain gave to the Lord. It's about when Cain gave to the Lord. Look at verse 3 again. In the course of time, no indication, you know, at all about well, uh, uh, any tie-in to any time. This is just as, as Cain then just decided to do this, he brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. What is given, it isn't the issue, it's when it is given that is. Abel gave the first, he gave the best of what he had been given by God. Cain gave some of what he had been given to God. It's like God is saying, hey, I don't care what you do as far as your occupation. When it comes to giving, I do care when you do it, because when you do it lets me know if I'm on your mind or not. When you do it actually lets me know if you're thinking about me first or not, God is saying. When you do, it lets me know if you know who gives you the ability to give to me in the first place. What you have to give is not my issue. When has always been my issue. Cain brought a sacrifice of fruits, but not the first fruits. That's the difference. Cain brings a sacrifice of fruits, but it's not the first fruits. Abel brought the best while Cain brought the rest. Abel brought the best while Cain brought the rest. Abel brought from the first, he brought the first to the one who is first. And Cain brought secondhand fruit to the one who came in second. And you can guess who came in first in Cain's world. Reminds me, i got to explain this. I, I could quickly say this in an older setting, but I need to explain it a little bit to, to some of you. Back before there was electronics. That's, that's way back. When a kid had to, when he was told when you went in a store to put your hands in your pocket, you go in a, none of you have probably ever heard that, the young ones. Put your hands in your pocket, we're going to the store, don't you touch a thing. And as you went in, if you were good and you came back out, 
Dad would get or mom would get out a nickel at first. I'm not that old or a dime, a quarter for me. And you could ride on the mechanical horse that was outside the grocery store if you were good. And you just put this quarter in and all it started doing was this. And it's like, well, look at me. You're looking at everybody saying, you're looking at me. You're looking at me on this mechanical horse. Now, what's interesting here is that there's a little boy and a girl that had his share. And the little boy, he's sitting up front, his little sister's behind him. And he says this, if one of us would get off, there would be more room for me. <laughs> that, that's Cain. That, that's who's first and who's second in his mind. See, Abel did what was honorable. Cain did not. Now, later on, when God says to the people, his people, when the, the law has been delivered, all these kinds of things, he gives us then what he considers a proper or a right offering to him. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9 it's recorded, is recorded. Honor the Lord. This is what giving is all about. This is what our offering is about. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. Everybody say first fruits. First fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now today, in our uh, capitalistic society, economy, um, it doesn't, you know, we, some of us don't fit in here. We don't have the crops in the field. Many of you do. Uh, we don't have the vineyards, you know, with the vats. You know, we, many, not many of you do, but maybe somebody does. Uh, but, you know, we're in this capitalist. So we need to look at this like I've supply, supplied you an income. I will continue to supply you an income, and it will be filled to overflowing and uh, brimming over, okay? This is an agrarian economy that he's writing to, and that's all that there was at the time. We, we need to bring it into uh, up to date with us, okay? So bringing the Lord the best of what he's given is honorable. It's honoring him. To honor is to respect, it's to admire, it's to place in his rightful place. Our faith then in God enables us to respect and honor uh, and admire the Lord. So Cain brings an offering, but not a right offering. Cain brought what he considered to be good enough, but it was unacceptable to God. So give God what is right, not what is left. Secondly, then, faith makes your offering right. Giving that offering in faith makes it right. It takes faith to make a right offering. In the New Testament, then, so we're just so blessed. Uh, we, as we looked at this and as the uh, people of God in the Old Testament looked at this, they didn't have what we have today. We have in the book of Hebrews, then, it can tell us if we're making a right application, a right understanding of this. And in Hebrews 4, 11, and in verse 4, where the writer there is talking about faith, he can't help but talk about this first act of faith to God. We're, uh, we're told, by faith, everybody say faith. faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous, meaning he's right with God now. God and him have come back together in a sense when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. He's speaking to you right now. Oh, Abel's just having a good old time chatting with us this morning. Abel's righteousness was preceded. His rightness with God was preceded by his faith. And so we see that the offering he made was out of his faith. For Cain, it was not. By faith, Abel brought a, God a better offering than Cain did. So you and I, we're going to be tempted, just like Cain, to hold back from God. It's not enough to bring an offering. It needs to be a right offering, an offering that's driven by your faith in God. God, we're told, he did not look with favor. Now, why not? Why didn't God look with favor? I mean, he's a God of love. He's got a mercy. He's even a God of grace. Why couldn't he look you know, on this offering with favor? Well, could he? Is he capable of doing this? Is there anything God can't do? You know, we, you have these debates when you're growing up in your faith, and maybe a child will say to his parents, is there anything God can't do? And you're like, mm, no, 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 I'm kind of stuck here. You know, the, we, we talk about well, God can do anything, right? Well, really? I think about that. Can, can, can God lie? You see, all the characteristics uh, of God, uh, all of them are infinite 
uh, in, in their character. For example, his love is infinite. It just goes on and on and on forever. His power forever and ever. God is also truth. He's truth. So he cannot lie. It is not possible for God to lie. Also, God cannot be second. He can't be second. He can't accept being second. He's preeminent. He's over all things. He's over everything. He's above us. He's above all creation. He's higher than all, before all. He's only first of all. And so he can't be second or accept being second. Now, we say put God first. We say that. We say, you know, seek God first. But that's from our own flawed priority. But regardless of you do it or not, is God first or not? He's first. He's only first. He, he, the cosmos is all aligned with he being preeminent, he being first. That's the reality. So we are just to bring ourselves in our thinking and then our actions into recognizing that he is first. He can never be second. So God could not accept Cain and his offering. Now, again, notice the offerer is attached to his offering, and it's put before the offering now. Our offerings that we bring, God connects us to it, and then he puts us before the offering. If, I want to imagine how many of you, and this is, I guess, sexist. I don't know. Okay, so cancel me. I don't care. Um, how many of you ladies like to receive roses? I know it's not everybody, but okay, a couple hands go up, okay? But we can all understand what I'm saying here. Those who love to receive roses. <laughs> it's so weird because some of you are going like, I don't want to admit to that, not in today's culture, you know. And, uh, you know, but if, if, if you say you, you receive love, when somebody gets you roses, you, receive, you feel loved that way. You feel loved. Uh, and, you know, you, you like their smell. You like their appearance. You like the, uh, what's behind them giving it. You know, you know they're going to die, that kind of thing. But you say, you know, hey, uh, I, I, I feel loved when I receive roses. Well, there's a couple ways that you could actually give those roses to, to this one. So I'm trying to help some of you guys out if you notice any hands going up, right? You can go in and, and buy the roses. And when they say, okay, and he's not, not that one. How about these over here? These look better. Okay, fine. Those are a favorite kind of thing. Uh, would you like uh, those boxed up? Yeah, and uh, how about, you? yeah, put some of that foo-foo paper in there, you know, that they like, and uh, you got this box, and, and that way, or you can get a vase or vase, do it that way, right? And then you could come and say, hey, sweetheart, I know you said you, you love roses, and so I wanted to give them to you, and what do you do? You, you receive that. You feel that love. Now, some can think this way, and, uh, you know, Lord, help him. Um, he, could, he could go in and just say, uh, I need some roses. Which one? Oh, any of any old rose. And the, the, they may think, okay, this is going to be easy. And they start picking the roses <laughs> they want to give you. And uh, you get to go, you want a box? No, I don't need a box. You don't need a box. She just wants roses. Okay. She said, okay. Vase? No, no, nope, just give them to me. And then you come home, you walk in, and there they are just laying on the table. Petal over here, leaf over here, right? Well, you got what you wanted, right? But did you get it how you wanted it? You wanted roses, but not how you wanted it. No, you didn't get them how you wanted God can't separate the gift from the giver. And when he looks at the gift, he's looking at you. He's looking at me. There's no way he can detach you from your gift. And as we see here, he focuses on you. And that, over that gift, John 3, 16, we know it, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave, he gave. And so we can't separate that gift from that giver, from God. And we just, we just love that, right? He gave you, uh, to you. But when did he give it to you? When did he give his son? Well, Scripture tells us from the foundations of the world, this was God's intention. You were already on his mind before you were even born. Before you sinned, before you needed a savior, you needed this gift. God already had you on his mind when he gave it to you. That brings us then to our application. Number three, give up your heart. Give up your heart. Verse six, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Story is told of Cyrus, the founder of the, uh, the emperor of the old Persian Empire, that at one point in his conquest, he captured a prince and his family. That prince and family was brought before him, and the emperor said then to the prince, uh, what will you give me if I release you? And he said, uh, your majesty, I will give you half of my wealth. And then Cyrus said, what if I release your children? He said, everything I possess. He said, well, what if I release your wife? He said, your majesty, I will even give you myself. Now, Cyrus was so moved by that that he released the prince and his family. He just let him go. Well, as they were on their way home, uh, the prince said to his wife, he said, did, did you notice that city? I mean, it's unlike any. It was so beautiful. Did you notice the streets? And did you notice his guards? You know, the armies that he had? And that big palace. I mean, just, just did you notice that? And, and, and Cyrus, uh, he, he was a, he's a handsome man, isn't he? And with a look of deep love for her husband, she said, I didn't notice. I could only keep my eyes on you, the one who was willing to sacrifice himself for me. It takes the right heart to give the right gift. Making the right offering isn't just about the money or material possessions. It's God talking about us giving of ourselves. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, to the believer then, Paul's instructing us, all of us, we need to offer our bodies, all that we are, offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Abel committed his spiritual act of worship when he gave that sacrifice of himself. It was holy and it was pleasing to God. The greatest commandment, remember, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. So we don't just give God some of us, we're to give him all of us. Verse 7 said, if you do what is right, Cain, you will be accepted. You'll be accepted if you do what is right. Now, let's just pause there. Does anyone know what the right thing to do, you know, was to do? Are, are we there yet? What's the right thing for Cain to do now? To give what? To give first, to give first. Cain saw his brother's offering. He saw what his offering, he saw his offering. He saw that Abel and his gift was accepted. He saw that his offering and him, he, it was rejected. So God says, you will be accepted, Cain, if you do what is right. So right then he had the opportunity to change his mind. Change his mind. That's, that's, that's repentance when we get to the New Testament. To change our mind. And then right then, Cain had an opportunity to give up thinking what he thought was the right gift to God or what he thought was a good gift to God. Verse 7, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. See, giving affects your behavior. If you do what is right, you'll be accepted. If you refuse to do what is right, watch out. The moment you stop doing right, then there's the opportunity to sin. It desires to have you, but God says you must rule over it. So do you know what the right thing to do is? Cain had that opportunity to do the right thing, but because he didn't give up, he wound up rebelling again against God and compromising then himself before God. So Cain and Abel represent Two types of givers in human history. Because Cain couldn't kill his pride. He couldn't kill his ego. Instead, he struck out against his brother. This is a perfect opportunity for Cain to grow up, to allow God to change his heart. He tells, God tells Cain, look, it's a beautiful basket of uh, apples and gourds, but your heart isn't worshiping me. I give your brother an A, and I'm flunking you in worship 101, in a sense, he's saying. But here's the good news, Cain. You can take the test again. You can have another chance. And so Cain has a choice. He can listen to God. He can learn. He can change. He can grow up. 
Or he can throw a pity party and stay in his anger. And sadly, he chooses the pity party. Look at verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And there's an underlying lesson for us here. You know, don't come to Jesus. Don't follow Jesus. Don't trust in Jesus if you want to stay stuck in your bad habits and your bad attitudes. He, Jesus loves you, yes, in that. But he won't let you stay in that. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Where is your brother? After Cain's father, Adam, had sinned against God, what did God say? How did he greet him that uh, afternoon? Where, Adam, where are you? Did God know? Cain responds with a bold-faced lie and, a, and, and, and hard-hearted sarcasm. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? God gives Cain a chance to confess and come, ple- come clean, but Cain chooses otherwise. Look at verse 10. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood, he cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a reckless, a restless wanderer on the earth. See, God always allows us to make our own choices. Jesus was, was, was big on this, too. He said, you can choose a narrow gate or a wide gate. You can choose a narrow road to go down or a, a wide road. You can choose to build on a rock or you could build on the sand. You can serve God or you can serve money. You can be found among the sheep or you can be found among the goats. See, God gives us eternal choices that have eternal consequences. Preacher and author Max Lucado Uh, has written this. He said, isn't this the reminder of Calvary's trio, referring to the three uh, crosses and the three individuals on the crosses there on Calvary? Isn't this the reminder of Calvary's trio? Ever wonder why Jesus was in the center? Why not on the far right, the far left? Could it be that the two crosses on the hill symbolize one of God's greatest gifts, the gift of choice? The two criminals have so much in common. They begin with the same sarcasm. Scripture tells us the two criminals also said cruel things to Jesus. But one changed. One of the criminals on the cross, he begins shouting these insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Then save yourself and us. But then we're told that the other criminal stopped him and said, you should fear God. You are getting the same punishment he is. We are punished justly, getting what we deserve for what we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. And one good choice for eternity offsets a thousand bad choices here on the earth. The choice is yours. How can two brothers be born of the same mother and father, grow up in the same home, one choose life, the other chooses death? Let's give up. Let's make the right choice, giving God our whole hearts. Let's pray. Father, all through Scripture, we see that you are a giver. That you give, uh, you gave your only son for our, for, for our benefit, for our need. And Father, we see that you want the same for us. Father, as we turn in a moment to communion, we're told that Jesus uh, took the, the bread and he gave it as he gives his life then for us. Given for you, my body given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. So thank you for the reminders weekly of your goodness, your grace toward us. Help us to bring it into our heart and our mind daily, your great love for us. And may we become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. With the um, rate that um, changes are happening now in the world, and both in material things of the world and in society, I've been trying to um, figure out a, a good way to evangelize. How, how do you go about just having a conversation with somebody about Jesus? Now, in, in the past, you would um, help someone, you know, fill a need that they have, and that could be an opportunity for a conversation to start. But it, it seems today that most people have more than they already need. Um, used to, a, a friendly debate over creation or evolution could open the door. But nowadays, the truth, it, it, it's very seldom questioned. And you don't dare talk about morality or you will more likely than not be offending them and, and you will get canceled. Um, and if you ask what happens when someone dies, then you got to tell them, well, there's a hell and God is good. And it's just not easy. It does, it's just kind of awkward. So the only thing left is purpose. Why are we here? What, what gives us value? What's the meaning of life? And my guess is that most, most of them have never even thought about it. Or I don't even know if they even care. When in reality, the whole problem with mankind is that we've lost our purpose. God has made us in his image so we had this ability to have a relationship with him. And it's the only way that you can give and receive love. When Adam and Eve sinned, whenever we sin, no more relationship. We separated ourselves from God. At, at communion, we're reminded how good God is and how much that he values us. So once we believe that God, God's son Jesus was sacrificed as a payment for our sin, how could we not tell him that we're sorry about what we've done? Why would we not be baptized? Immediately, our sins are forgiven, relationship restored, God just loving us like crazy providing for all our needs, forgiving us every time in the future that we stumble into sin, and the Holy Spirit giving us strength and courage and wisdom. And what about hope? Knowing this is forever, and that after we die, it gets even better. Kaylee would say, this is the greatest thing ever. It's like the greatest thing ever, she would say. But it's not like the greatest thing ever. It is the greatest thing ever. You know, maybe I'll just try saying that next time. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, um, we can never thank you enough for providing a way to restore our relationship, a way that um, you could be our perfect father, um, be back to being our loving dad. We, we just thank you for the countless, the good and precious gifts that we receive from you. Thank you for the hope that... Um, steadies us in this world of change we just praise you for this is grace and you truly are the great i am in jesus name amen